It's great to see you in person, Todd. Yeah, ditto. We're, we're here at Warp Drive Tech, yep. Statesville, North Carolina. So, uh, do you remember how? Out. Do you remember how we met? How we met through Jeremy? No, no, no. We were both bugging Elon Musk on Twitter. We were. Yes, that's how we met. We met each other on Twitter. Uh, Elon Musk mentioned something about uh, um, looking into anti gravity or something like that. And I no. sent him my warp drive paper. Yeah. <laughs> we first got to go to Mars or something like that in order to develop warp drive or, you know, have a reason to develop it. And we were both bugging him on Twitter. This was, this was way before he owned Twitter. And I'm like, who's this warp drive tech guy? So I friended you, friended me, and we were able to start a conversation. And that's, uh, I think that was before APEC. That was before APEC, yeah. Yeah, and then I found out about you at Estes Park. And then Jeremy looked me up and pulled me in. Jeremy, uh, Jeremy's been involved as well. And uh, we both uh, met uh, Amy Eskridge, of course. She was at uh, the Estes Park that you were at, right? Mm-hmm. In 2016. Um, rest in peace. And uh, yeah, and here we are, finally uh, meeting in person. We've been working yeah. for years together. On various projects, and I know you helped me out with the. Uh, it's like when I met Rick Storty. I met him in like 1998, but I didn't actually meet him in person until like 2011. <laughs> and it kind of feels like I've known you for years because there's really no difference, you know. Being here in person, though, it's it was great. We got to set up your your uh, machine shop. Thank you very much. Big help. And, uh, uh, Tim had this ingenious idea to leverage the table to use to. To, to get the uh, lathe up, so that we was got it. Oh, we got it's it. Amazing. Yeah, that was that was a that was a big that was a big dose of dopamine for me today that we got that in place. So uh, what are we doing here? Well, I'm hoping that you've got that all that stuff from uh, Canada. That you're gonna oh, yeah. do some good tests coming up. Oh yeah, I'm excited. Uh, that has got to be the most complex. Alzafon experiment contraption ever built. Um, and George Hathaway has this knack for going overkill on things. And you know it's overkill when you never, when you do more than was necessary, but you never complete it. Well, <laughs> and that's what exactly what George did. He, he, he went with this ruby crystal, which uh, I, I happen to agree with David Alzafon, the non-scientific son, who said that was a mistake because uh, if you're doing electron paramagnetic resonance, you want the free electrons to be free. As soon as you bind them up, there's nothing special about the aluminum anymore. So just because ruby has aluminum and chromium and all these things, doesn't mean shit if all those electrons are bound up. And, you know, you got to be able to saturate them to get a strong effect. Well, you got to be careful not to oversaturate them too. That's another thing I learned is... Um, and that may explain some of the effects we've seen in the, uh, in the weight loss. Like it wasn't always consistent because if you oversaturate them, they don't come, they don't transfer their energy via the hyperfine as they're, uh, coming down in power. Right. So there's, there's a, there's a small band of energy at which put enough energy in. They'll stay there. Yeah. yeah and not too much that they'll stay there just to write them out so that it can come, you know, they can come down and transfer their orientation to the core and. You know, start manipulating the uh, strong force and the gluons and all the other great stuff that are going on in the core of the atom, which we don't fully understand. Yep. So, well, what are you most excited about now? I thought we just did this. <laughs> <laughs> We're doing it again. No, I'm I'm excited about uh, David Steary coming up. He's he's working on. Um, unified field theory with me and and Michael and I'm very interested on the outcome of these experiments um, you now have this machine where you can put the sample in there and and with the sample tube and check it and I'm hoping that there's going to be a way to check it with some gradient on the field um, but That's we need to test it very easy to create gradient <laughs> yeah but we need to do it without magnetic materials when we do that yeah but um, other than that, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm anxious to see what happens there. Which way do you think it would go in the, in the gradient? It's supposed to follow the gradient to the lesser, not the stronger. It should go, like if it's stronger below and 
lesser above, it should want to walk up to the lesser field, not the stronger field. If it's magnetic material like iron or something, it's going to want to pull to the stronger field. It's different. It's not gravity then. It's just magnetism. Right, right. Yeah, so we have to differentiate between these different forces. Yeah. And, uh, That's why I'm like pure, pure samples are easier to differentiate when they're mixed quantities. It may allow you to saturate more, but it, it confounds what we think was going on. We don't really know. Also, pure thin films on top of each other. If yeah. you're going to be mixing yeah. stuff, they, they're not just going to be mixed hodgepodge in a, in, in a crucible. They need to be thin, pure layers of each material, which brings us back to that arts parts thing that we saw, because that is ultra pure, thin layers of different materials. And uh, you know, one thing we know about uh, electron paramagnetic resonance, when you're dealing with these high frequency waves, they don't like to penetrate very deep. You know, the lower the frequency, the stronger the density. Skin effect, even at low, even at 60 hertz, the skin effect is still thin. I mean, yeah. I mean, it, you got to be ultra low frequencies to get any kind of penetration depth in metals. So. So another thing that uh, George uh, did with his experiment, he added a vacuum component, so that the the sample sitting in a vacuum, which was probably harder to accomplish than everything else, and then on top of that he added cryogenics. Yeah, I don't see the need for it. I mean, for one, gravity doesn't need cryogenics to work. Right. right? And the other is that we're not dealing with anything hot or cold where air convection is going to cause a weight change. Well, the thermal effects such as uh, you know Brownian motion tends to disrupt uh, nuclear spin alignments. So removing that from the equation lets you say it's not that, and it lets you concentrate more on the paramagnetic uh, and the ESR, the electron uh, electron paramagnetic resonances, and the NMR, which are greatly uh, enhanced from cold temperatures. Because otherwise you get the noise of, uh, of thermal energy. But one thing that George said that was very interesting, and this is why it's called anti-gravity, by the way, is, be, is the, there, there's this relaxation time with all these experiments. The NMR and EPR, there's always a relaxation time. You energize it, you get half a second, you get a microsecond, you get a nanosecond, whatever it is. But it's always related to temperature. And that's obvious because Brownian motion screws it up. You know, it bumps everything together. But when you get rid of all Brownian motion, at least as close to, to, to zero Kelvin as you can get, it's still getting screwed up. There's still something that's bouncing against those uh, nuclear spins that are screwing them up, making them relax. And uh, they theorize the only thing that could possibly be interacting with it is gravity. So anti-gravity. It's damping. It's dampening gravity. Yeah. And uh, they theorize if you keep it in that state, you'd be dampening gravity. Yep. Do you think they've discovered this already? No. You don't think so? No. Come on. EPR was discovered in 19... Yeah, but I don't think anybody has put, put two and two together because nobody understands quantum gravity. Well, what if they... We heard in the Jesse Michaels video about their... There was this conference back in the 50s where basically shrink theory started, and that's where the greatest minds wasted their lives on useless theories. Well, even in string theory, according to David, I don't know a lot of string theory, but according to what he's saying is that they've taken the same things that we're looking at for electromagnetism, and they put it into their gravity model. And there's no point to it. It hasn't produced a single no. verifiable result or experiment or anything. No, but I said that in the 80s when it first came out, that there's yeah, nothing here. It came out before then, but yeah. uh, that's when it really started to catch on. I was like, this is nuts. There's people that wasted, that, that literally spent their entire life 
Yeah. On string theory. Brain dream. <laughs> and and they have nothing to show for it. Yeah. I remember uh, uh, reading a uh, a string theory book, and I've read one page like three or four times. It never made sense to me. I just kept reading it over and over again until I got sick of it. <laughs> it made sense to me. It's just that it's just it's not physics. It's playing with math. You know, if there's no experiment you can do, no observables you can measure, you're just playing with numbers. You've got nothing there. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm a realist, so for me it's like, I gotta have something to measure. If it can't be measured, it has no effect. That's right, that's right. I mean, physics, the, the term itself, came from, you know, the study of the physical world. And the spirit of things. Yeah, the spirit of, of nature. It's the study of the natural world as it is. And if you're, when you're doing light experiments like you have set up in front of us, when you're doing uh, materials uh, experiments, when you're playing with RF, that is the physical world. But when you're scribbling on a whiteboard and imagining different things, that's not the physical world. Yeah. That's imagination. We, get, we have to make a distinction. Tim, what else should we talk about? Well, I mean, so one of the things that Todd talked about earlier was damping input and how that was important to like, explain the Alpha Flaw model. You said that there were seven different explanations for it. I think that might oh. be interesting to get into also. Oh, yeah. There's, uh, I, I've encountered this several times with the Alpha Flaw experiment that I'd show up to a physicist, give them the paper. They'd read the theory part first, of course, because it is in the beginning of the paper. And they say, that's bullshit because of X, Y, and Z. And then I show them the experiment, and I think for a moment, they're intrigued. And then they're like, that's going to work because of my theory. And I've seen this many, many times. And um, so, so far, there's about seven theories counting <laughs> as to why it will work. I haven't done a full analysis on all of them. I have a lot of confidence in my theory because it's not a different theory. It's just a different interpretation. Yeah. No, there's, there's always different ways of interpreting things. Uh, a, a great example of that would be um, if we did the uh, Michelson-Morley experiment during the age of uh, heliocentricity uh, when we were debating whether the Earth and, or the, the Sun is the center of the universe. If we'd done it then, we'd assume that the, the Earth is the center of the solar system because it's not changing. You know, so it all depends on what you're starting with. So just because a theory predicted a certain result and we saw that result in the natural world does not mean the theory is correct. It doesn't mean the interpretation of the theory is correct. Sometimes the theory may be correct, but the interpretation is wrong. That could be too, yeah. And I think that's, that's where you differ with Einstein and his curved space thing, right? It's a matter of interpretation. <laughs>